right then. Okay. Um, I'm glad to see that you're here. Not completely broken, it's day four. So let's see if we can do something about that. Or maybe not. So what have we done? Uh, we've spent three days. We have talked about a bit of fluid dynamics. We talked a fair bit about the thermodynamics, what goes into the fluid dynamics. We talked a bit about modes. And yesterday we talked a bit about um, tides as an application for where the modes could show up in uh, real astrophysics. Okay? And I think that got us up to a point that I expect many of you, if you're doing gravitational waves in some shape or form, are familiar with the love number and the tidal determinability because it's something that people are trying to detect now. Okay? So we didn't do it in general relativity, but the calculation is not. <clears throat> if you focus on the simpler version of the calculation, it's, it's really easy. It's really easy, which is why a lot of nuclear physicists are doing that calculation. They build the equation state, work out mass radius and tidal deformability, and then they write the paper and say, look, isn't this great? And so on. They don't need to know more. Um, if you want to do, develop this field, you need to do a bit more. So today we're gonna to do a different thing. First, we worked out, uh, actually yesterday in the, pro in the tutorial, you worked out, or someone worked out, the F mode frequency, right? And then we called out what the numbers were for the typical frequency and they ranged over many orders of magnitude. Uh, but so what we learned yesterday, <coughs> The F mode has a frequency of something like one to two, one to three kilohertz. So it's a high frequency oscillation. Now, if you know anything about uh, LIGO today, you know that as it gets up to kilohertz, the sensitivity drops um, a little bit faster than on the plots. You see the sort of idealized plots where shock noise comes in a little bit harder in the current detectors. So the plan is that in the next generation, this window will open up. So understanding this better is important for next generation cosmic explorer Einstein telescope, which is probably more than 10 years away, almost certainly more than 10 years away, which means I will have nothing to do with it. It's over to you. Um, so what you could do is based on what we had, <coughs> Newtonian still. You can work out how much gravitational waves do we get from this mode? How fast does it damp? Okay? And the number comes out something like, let's call it damping time, something like a fraction of a second. Precise numbers don't matter. They depend on the equation of state, how big the star is and things like that. doesn't matter. So this is something that goes ping. It doesn't long, last for a very long time. Uh, now that's bad because if you want to detect the gravitational waves, a short burst will have to have a very large amplitude to be detectable. And typically, then you can go and say, okay, so what happens in, in the universe? How much energy can I play with if a star suddenly contracts or something like that, anything you make up and you find this is gonna be really difficult, okay? So that's why for detecting these F modes, people typically look for core collapse supernova where you have a dramatic event or, but even then it's that's difficult because the signal is probably not detectable from outside our galaxy or certainly not far outside. And then you have to ask, okay, how often do supernovae happen in the galaxy? And the answer is maybe a few times every hundred years. And then you have to bank and say, you're starting your PhD working on detecting gravitational waves from supernova core collapse. Are you willing to spend 30 or 40 years before you get your result? The answer is going to be no. You can ask, if you ask for a lot of money to build a detector to detect this, 
and you say, yeah, I want to build this instrument and I want to run it for 30 or 40 years, then I'll get the result. You're not going to get that money. So that's not a good plan. Of course, if this were to happen tomorrow, it would be fantastic. So there's a flip side, right? So then we have to look further out, and that's when we look for neutral star binary mergers, which we know happen, and where we know that when the remnant settles down, it will oscillate in something that looks like this, this F mode. And that's why neutral star merger simulations, which I may talk a little bit about tomorrow to finish off, um, are important, and they tell us that this is going to come into play with next generation detection. So that's a little bit negative in, in some sense, we have to wait. <clears throat> but you could ask, are there ways of either increasing the amplitude right, somehow or making the mode live longer? If it lived longer, then you could integrate over the signal for longer, you gain in gravitational wave signal to noise, and so it becomes more detectable. Which is why uh, binary in spiral that lasts for a long time with many cycles is more detectable than something that just goes ping. Okay? So that leads us to ask possible. Okay, so let's go here. Is it possible that the mode could be in some situations unstable so that the amplitude grows and maybe it lasts a bit longer? Okay. So that's the question today. <clears throat> and now, instabilities in stars come in two classes. We tend to separate dynamical instabilities from secular instabilities. So this division is not, it's not kind of clean. There's a little bit of a gray zone in the middle. Let's not worry about that. Um, if you want to be really tidy about it, a secular instability is something that exists in a star without dissipation, viscosity, radiation, anything just there. Don't need to add anything to the fluid equation for stuff. A secular instability requires that you add viscosity, gravitational waves, or something else. Okay? And that means that the dynamical time instability happens fast, because it happens on a dynamical time scale. A typical example that you're familiar with, perhaps, is, or well, probably, is the maximum mass of neutron stars or white dwarfs where we reach this Chandrasekhar type limit, where actually what happens is the radial modes of the star become unstable. So they cross over and because the radial modes become unstable, this radial oscillation starts growing and eventually just pushes too hard and the star collapses. Okay? That's a dynamical instability. You don't add anything. You just take the fluid equations, calculate the radial mode and so on. Okay? <clears throat> Now, if you're looking at the non-radial modes, which we're looking at because we're interested in gravitational waves, at least I am, then there's also a dynamical instability of the non-radial modes. It's usually called the bar mode instability. And that is basically, if you spin the star up, right, as fast as you can go, and then perhaps add differential rotation to make it go even faster, at some point, the star decides it would rather look like an American football, an ellipsoid, then a ball, then a sphere. That's called the bar mode instability. It's a dynamical <coughs> instability, and it's an instability of the F mode. Okay? So all you need here is to add rotation. Hmm. 
Now, the problem with this is that you need quite a lot of differential rotation for a typical star for this to happen. And so you have to ask, when can I get that? Maybe in collapse again, or maybe in mergers, but it's very difficult to see how you get this from a star sitting on its own, maybe interacting with this environment. This is difficult, but it's technically that. Secondary instabilities, you have to add <clears throat> something. If we add gravitational waves, we get something called the Chandrasekhar Friedman Schutz instability, discovered by Chandra. And then the technical details were worked out pretty much the way I'm going to do it today by John Friedman and Bernard Schutz in the 1970s. Now, it's instructive, I think, to go beyond the um, paper that came out in 1978, which is very famous. Okay? It's called Secular Instability, blah, blah, blah. And okay. That's where people, people just say, we know we should cite this paper. But it's interesting to contemplate the journey that led these two people to this paper. So John Friedman was a student of Chandra, started his PhD around 1970-ish, when this instability was first sort of talked about. And then he worked on this on his own and with Bernard Schutz and Chandra a little bit for eight years, okay? eight years. Bernard Schutz was a student of Kip Thorne wrote his PhD on something related to this, and then he worked with John Friedman off and on on this for up to eight years. So this is telling you that what we're going to discuss now did not come easy. And then in 1970, so I'm going to do this in Newtonian, there's one paper showing the same result in general relativity. It's by John Friedman the same year. And that paper, is serious GR. It is hardcore. I wouldn't claim to understand it. I think <laughs> after many, many years, I probably do, but you know, this is not, if you start reading that, you're gonna go, okay, he knows what he's doing. Or maybe he has no idea what he's doing and neither do I. And it says, because you're gonna get lost. Okay. <clears throat> so the problem is much, much harder in general. And there hasn't been much work on the formal side of this since then. Okay, so if you add gravitational waves, you get this guy, but you can also add viscosity and then you get something called a, I'm not gonna write down a name for it, it doesn't have a, Person associated with it. It's a viscosity driven instability where the star goes unstable because you got friction. So basically, the rule here is you need to add dissipation. There's some dissipation, it could be viscous damping, it could be gravitational wave emission that gives you a time scale, and then the instability acts on that time scale. So it's much slower than dynamical, it just goes, goes boom. Okay. okay, so this is what we're gonna be doing. Now, luckily for me and for you, we've already laid the foundation. We did most of the work yesterday. Now we just have to apply it. And I should go really slow because otherwise we finish early. Don't worry about it. When we get to the end, I can waffle as much as as much as I want. Okay. So what did we learn yesterday? So yesterday we wrote down. Um, the equations for Lagrangian perturbations, and because I don't want to be part of a comedy performance that will end up on YouTube forever, I'm not very much in love. 
although I wouldn't be that famous, so people wouldn't really care if I fell over. I suspect that I might laugh a couple of times, but that's it. So what we learned was that we can write an equation for the displacement vector Just schematically, and we made some progress on this, right? So we wrote it like second derivative on psi plus some operator times the time derivative on psi plus some other operator on psi. That was the equation. Okay? And then we invented. eta and psi, two solutions to this equation. This guy here, and then you plug in eta, it solves the same equation. <clears throat> we invented the inner product. So we had eta, let's drop in, this is again, because it's not lazy, or if you want eta i xi i, it's the integral over eta i conjugate at psi i and the density dv. That density sitting here is convention I decided to use now. You could put the density back in here and then take that out from there. It has to sit somewhere, otherwise it doesn't work. Okay? So we did that. And then we showed that these, if these were modes, they were orthogonal and stuff like that. And then we build that sum to get the tides, right? Today, we're going to go in a different direction, starting here, right? But you're going to recognize some of the things. First, the first thing you can do, and you can see that straight from here, is easy to show that eta, let's drop the indices now, Eta xi is the conjugate of psi eta. Okay. So that you can see just from the definition, take the conjugate of this that moves over here, just shunt them over because they're just numbers and this is the other way around, easy. Okay. Then we showed yesterday, at least we discussed, how the same is true for C xi. Although this is, this is quite messy to prove in reality, right? Because you need a lot of integration by parts. You need to use the Poisson equation. You need to use the perturbed the density, the continuity equation. This is uh, not an easy calculation. Okay? It's long. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that on the board. So there's a similar thing here. Well, fine. And then we use the fact that if it looks like this, then this problem becomes Hermitian and you can just expand in this basis. That's what we did. But now we're putting in rotation. So for rotation, then the background velocity is not zero. And that means that this B is not zero either. Okay. So now we have this piece. And this becomes a little bit different because this guy picks up a minus sign. That's quite easy, easy to show. Okay. So the C. There is a risk here that this looks really, really easy. But I can give you an example of why it's not necessarily so. Suppose I wanted to do so this, as I said, this is really, this is given straight from the definition of trivial. This is probably a line. This is probably a couple of pages. Okay? Because remember that C operator had a lot of stuff in it. Okay? Look at it term by term, see what happens if you integrate. 
is it in this integral and you cheat a little bit or you use tricks like Gauss's divergence theorem and things like that, integration by parts, use the surface vanishing, and there's lots of things going in, okay? It's messy. Now, let's just ask, because I know this, because we're working on this right now, what happens if I try to do this kind of thing, but in some other, something closer to general relativity, say post-Newtonian expansion, where I pick up some perturbed terms, okay? I can tell you it becomes absolutely horrendous. This calculation in post-Newtonian hydrodynamics, the first post-Newtonian order has been done in the literature once by Chandra, once in the 60s. No one has gone back to that. And there is a reason for that messy then you can ask well what happens in general relativity well the problem is it's not even clear here because now you get perturbed metrics all over the place i'm going to show you a little bit of that just as a hint tomorrow so the space time comes in and now your domain is not the fluid it's the entire space time so this whole story changes so this is nice but the step to general relativity is not a tool for the faint target. Okay. But for now, let's just see what we can learn from this. And then if there's some new phenomenology, I think we can argue that, well, if it exists in Newtonian gravity, it should exist in general relativity. The details might be different, but hey, that tends to be the way it is, right? But some phenomenon like, say, frame dragging, rotational frame dragging, can exist in general relativity, but not in Newtonian. But you will not find fluid dynamics in Newtonian that doesn't exist in general relativity. That would be kind of crazy. Okay. So then what we did, we took this and we built a symplectic structure. We called it W out of these two guys. And it was um, simpler yesterday because we didn't have the B, but now we're putting the B back in. So you have eta time derivative of, of psi plus half of B psi. Why the half is there, we're going to see in a, in a minute. And then we subtract off, subtract, the same thing, but hitting the, B, the eta with this combination. So e T eta plus a half eta times psi. Okay. So yesterday we didn't have this. Okay. That's new. But um, just like yesterday, this combination is conserved. With this in the product, we have a conserved quantity. So maybe, um, if you want, you can either show it or not. It doesn't cost much. But so, but actually, there's no real point in working through the details on the board. What happens is exactly like yesterday, right? This time derivative here, and then and so on, and that's just gonna give you some bits. And then you use, here yeah, when you take a second time derivative, you use the order equation, right? But now you have a half of B times time derivative. So you get half of this thing, right? Which is exactly what you need to cancel the half of that thing over there later. After you use this. So it's a good exercise, but I think I'll leave that to you. Okay, takes a couple of lines. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have a way of building conserved quantities. So what quantities are we interested in? Typically, when we talk about conservation laws for real bodies, energy, right? And angular momentum. 
Because these are conservation laws in nature. So this leads to what is called the canonical energy. It's called EC. And that's just defined by taking this W, which we know is conserved for any two solutions. And as yesterday, the time derivative of Xi is a solution because all these A's, B's, and C's are time independent, right? The time derivative of this just goes straight through. And dt Xi is a solution. Now I'm just saying, okay, the canonical energy is a pesky factor of a half, W on dt Xi and Xi. And now you can see if you plug this in, eta is dt xi. So this is dt xi, dt xi. That's what you expect because that's velocity squared. Right? And in the definition here, there's also density. There's density mass times velocity squared, and there's a half. That's kinetic energy. Right? And then from the next piece, that's going to actually disappear. Because when you get the time derivative here, you get, again, this guy comes into play and you can replace what you've got with this C, just like yesterday. So the Bs kind of drop out. And so what happens here is it becomes one half on dt psi with itself. So that's kinetic energy and a half times psi and six psi, which is potential energy. Right? Because the gravitational potential and stuff is sitting in here. Okay. B always satisfies this condition. If you just expand it out, you're going to see how it cancels because you need to use, you need to fall back and use this. If you didn't have this, it wouldn't work. Okay? But then it's kind of easy. <clears throat> so this is conserved, right? Because that's conserved and this belongs to that class. And the canonical, any canonical. Canonical angular momentum is the word. Otherwise, you can write down the same thing again, but that would be a waste of time. So now there's a JC. And so what does angular momentum do? It's got to do with rotation. Here we have a coordinate system where we have a rotation axis. Let's take that in the phi direction, spherical coordinates type. And so it's kind of intuitive that this should be something like a half again, W, but now a phi derivative on Xi and, and Xi itself. Okay. <coughs> so you can just plug this in if you want, and then work a little bit, which I'm not going to do. And you can show just for completeness now that this is minus the real part of d phi psi acting on the dt psi plus the half psi. It doesn't matter because we're not going to use the <coughs> we're not going to use the precise expressions. Okay. Okay. So now we have an energy in an angular momentum. Or the real part. Because what happens here, you see, if we can make this kind of intuitive, okay? I want this guy, I plug it in there. Now I had the phi derivative, I know because of axis symmetry. So, means that even if I can't expand in some other basis, I can always expand in, in the phi angle, I always have That expansion, right? Then you plug this in here, say only there's a phi derivative, then that becomes an IM, right? So when you get this guy, it becomes a complex conjugate piece. So you're subtracting a 
function with these complex conjugates, so suddenly you have an imaginary part, and then you have to be a bit witty to realize that that's actually the real part of this. This goes in several, that's why I skipped it, because it takes several steps. It's not, we're not gonna use it explicitly, so it doesn't matter, you can work it out. Okay? The imaginary part vanishes, doesn't, doesn't come into it, it's gone. <clears throat> which makes sense because at the end of the day, this should just be, this should not be complex numbers because we don't have any damping or anything. They should be real numbers. Okay? And so they are. Okay? So this is the, the plan. We have these two guys, but actually, uh, and you can do things like now you can have modes, you can work out what these guys would be and get actual numbers. We're not going to do that. We're going to make one observation. Okay. And then we're gonna, we're gonna use this a little bit. Though again, I'm, I'm just gonna give you the result because it takes a little bit of time. So the first thing we do is look at this one. If I now pretend that I know that this is, goes like um, e to the i omega t with some frequency, right? Then this guy here brings out an i omega, right? And this guy here brings out an i m phi. And then you can see that these two guys are going to be related. They have to be. And so these two relations lead us straight up to something that's almost ridiculously simple. That EC has to be minus omega over M times JC. That's the color. And this actually has to be true. This is generally true for any radiation. But the energy and angular momentum have to be related like this. It's not surprising. In fact, we could almost have guessed that this, this had to happen. So now we're going to take a slight sidestep, which is important. <clears throat> Let's think of a mode. For a mode solution, we had something like e to the i omega t plus m phi, right? In general. Now you can ask what happens if we ask, you've see, probably seen this in undergraduate kind of courses, what is the phase velocity? Phase velocity is you say, well, this, I'm moving along with a crest of this wave or something like that. You're basically setting this constant. And then you see that that leads to the phi dt being minus omega over m. Okay. So this is something we call, so it's phase speed, if you like. But we tend to call this the pattern speed. That's just a language that people use, and you should maybe know that it exists, okay? So this defines this pattern speed as sigma p, okay, which is just this thing. Okay? If I have a mode for some m, I calculate the frequency, I can work this out. What does it mean? Well, it means that if the positive, this frequency is positive, that is positive, then the wave goes kind of backwards. Whereas if this is positive and that's negative, it goes forward. Okay? And you know that in a, in a general expansion, I've got all the M's up to the L value in spherical harmonics. So I have both negative and positive. So I'll have waves going backwards and forwards. Yesterday, we didn't talk about this. Because the problem yesterday was degenerate in M. If you didn't care about M. But now we have rotation. And so suddenly that rotation direction comes into play. Okay. So this basically says, if omega is positive, then we have, oh, it, it doesn't really matter, I should have brought any omega. relative to the rotation axis, 
So you can imagine, um, yesterday, we would have the same, but the star was just sitting there. There was no sense of forwards and backwards. You, know, you can define left and right, whatever you want, but there is no forwards and backwards. Now the star is rotating. Now we have a forwards, right? So forwards is a mode that goes, a wave that goes with it. Backwards is something that goes the other way. Okay? What did we do after that? So yesterday we looked at modes. So that was basically saying we took some solution psi and we let it be some psi n, which was not dependent on time, and then i n, i omega n times t. That's what we did, right? Now what I'm going to do is go plug that in here. actually here, and then there are a few steps. As I said, you need to pull out the frequencies. So it's, not, it's not pretty, okay? So I'm gonna do that a little bit of algebra where you know it's 200 pages. It's not, it's, it's, a, it's a half a page. So, what we can show, and this is the kind of big step, is that there is an inequality for this pattern spin that we just defined. So sigma p minus the rotation rate of the star, rotation frequency, times one plus one over m, has to be smaller than or equal to this canonical energy divided by m squared. Remember, m is just a number. And then normalization with this. So really what happens is I have this kind of expression that involves these inner products. And then I just say, well, if I have a time dependence, this is an omega and this is the im. And then I just divide through by the normalization. That's what's happening. But then it also has to be smaller than a very similar expression of sigma p is minus omega over one minus one. The only difference is on this side. Now, if we believe that result, we're done. You're saying, what do you mean you're done? You've got nearly an hour to go, you can't be done. Or you're thinking, yeah, hey, it's done, we can leave. Not done in that sense. Okay. But now we have everything we need. Okay. <clears throat> So here is the, the beautiful argument that I will probably mess up completely. What did we learn yesterday? We learned that there are modes that have finite frequency in the non-rotating star. We calculated them, the F modes and G modes, stuff like that. Okay? So we're gonna pick one of them. We're gonna ask what happens when we spin the star up. Okay? <clears throat> So this is going to be important for what happens in part two, if we get to part two, because in part two, we're going to see that there are modes that are not like this, but may also be interesting. <clears throat> now, um, the 
this guy here is the normalization, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, now if we look at this, so if we have a mode going forward, so let's call it co-rotating, So sigma p is positive, right? Moves with the star. And here, this is smaller than this because we're going in the limit, so this is small. This had some finite frequency, remember? So at some point, if this is small enough, that's going to be positive. And this has to be such that this is bigger than this and this is positive. So JC is positive. And then a counter moving mode. The sigma P is negative. Now this is negative, but now we go over here. This is negative, right? This is can be ignored compared to this. So JC has to be negative. Okay, that follows from here. And omega is small enough that we can ignore these terms. Okay. Okay, so then what? But now we march back up here and we say that actually, let's write it like P equal to sigma P JC. That's what I want. <clears throat> Sigma P is positive, JC is positive, EC is positive. Positive energy, we like that, right? Sigma P is negative, JC is negative, 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 positive. Energy is positive, we like that. This system is stable. The modes we calculated yesterday are stable in the slow rotation regime. Right? So now we're going to try to machine it in such a way that you see that there are situations where the modes are not stable. So now assume that there is some situation where this sigma p, um, yeah, sigma p changes sign. Okay. So There's some point where that vanishes, right? Okay. Or some fixed rotation rate. There's some spin where this happens, okay? <clears throat> now clearly what happens then is at that point, we flip between backwards and forwards, right? We go from backwards to forwards to forwards to backwards because we're changing the sign. Okay. If we're changing the sign here, then you can see that we're coming into dangerous territory. So the, all we need to do is prove now this vanishes, right? So we have not say we have an initially counter moving mode from here that changes, no, co that changes the counter, okay? And in this region, this guy will still be negative like down here for the same argument. 
So initially counter moving, there's two ways of running it, but we're gonna do that. Moving becomes core moving. So that mode has, this means that JC is negative, what we had, and then therefore, that changes sign, EC changes sign, and we have an instability. Perhaps. <clears throat> so, this is easy to see, right? Because this is some number. I've set in this to zero. Both of these guys are negative. So that has to be negative. If say sigma p changes sign, this has to happen. The energy becomes negative. We don't like that. Or we love it because we want the instability. Yes. Okay. So that's just saying we're changing the sign here. We're going from this one. We start here. Right? And then we go flip to this. Okay? But if we now go up and look here, that means there is a point when this is zero. There's a minus here. So this has to be negative. Sitting there, that means that the EC has to change sign at that point. So the energy becomes negative. Okay? Now this is not quite enough to get you an instability, but if you have radiation that takes energy away from the system, Right? The energy radiated infinity is positive, right? So it's now taking energy away from a reservoir of energy that's negative. And so this energy will have to grow. So for example, gravitational waves. <clears throat> That's the Chandrasekhar Friedman Schutz instability. I will sketch it right now. It's a great question. But you were one minute too early. <laughs> okay. So this is the argument. And now you can say, well, okay, so this, this can be purely theoretical. 45 minutes of your life, completely wasted. Question now becomes, are there modes in a rotating star? Remember, this entirely relies on there being rotation, right? Are there modes in a rotating star such that this guy, which is really simple, yeah? Change your sign. Okay. We know for the, so we did the calculation yesterday. <clears throat> Kind of. This is a sketch, it's not going to be very good, I suppose. So we calculated, so we solved for omega n squared in omega equals the north limit. Right? That's what we did. We found solutions that gives us. These two modes, right? right? Now we're going to ask ourselves what happens as we spin the star up? Now we get a splitting of the modes because the mode that goes forwards is dragged forwards a little bit more by the star. So the frequency goes up according to you over there. The other guy that tries to go backwards is 
drying forward, so it oscillates a little bit slower. Okay, so there's a splitting. These two guys split like this. Right? That's easy to understand. And now you can imagine, and this is what happens in a real calculation, right? That this guy comes down to some point. Because of the symmetry, this guy comes up to the same point. This guy goes on, and then actually what happens is at some point it meets this guy, and then they join. It looks a bit like that. Vastly exaggerated. Okay? This is the point the sigma p changes sign. Okay? So the mode is dragged forward by the rotation, wants to go backwards, drag forward according to you over there, right? And then at some point, the rotation is too fast. So it looks as if it goes forward. It's just, you know, Galilean invariance, adding velocities. That's all there is, right? Mode tries to go backwards, but actually the star rotates too fast, seems to go forward. And then this argument says, now, if you add, rota add dissipation, if you emit gravitational waves, this is going to be unstable. Okay. So this is a sketch from a real calculation. And so it does happen for the F mode that they do go through its symmetric stars. <clears throat> At this point, the two modes merge. And that's a funny point because at that point, the energy is zero. And if the energy is zero, then it can grow without violating the conservation law. Because it vanishes, right? So you multiply zero by whatever amplitude you want, it's still going to be zero. And that explains something we're not talking about, but that explains this piece, the dynamical instability. But I'm talking about the radiation for now. Okay. So that's pretty much the end of the Chandra Seca Friedman Schutz story for F mode. So now, then, what happens? Now we need to calculate this point. And so you calculate the way, and you find, not surprisingly, because here you can basically see that the frequency we calculate, so the frequency we calculated yesterday didn't care about the Ms, right? But as I go higher up for the overtones, the larger Ls, larger Ms come into play. So if I take a large enough M, I can always make this quite small. And therefore, if I make it small, then it's easier for this to become unstable. So, and in principle, because you can go up to infinite M's, that says this instability is going to be generic. It's always there. So all rotating stars are unstable. But still, they rotate. So they don't, it's like the bumblebee that doesn't know it shouldn't fly. It just does it. Stars are unstable, but they rotate anyway. So they do that because these are short, short scale. And so it's killed by viscosity. So what happens is in Newtonian theory, is that the L equals to M equals to four mode, I think is the most important. A 
And that's not so good because gravitational waves like quadrupoles. There's a higher multipole, it's not as efficient. And also, <clears throat> it's only unstable at something like 90% of what we call the Kepler limit, where the star break, breaks up. So the very roughly, it's, you need very fast rotation. So that doesn't look so good. But it would explain why we don't see any super fast pulsars, maybe. Okay, okay this is 1978. There's a lot of work now on to trying to figure out how this viscosity works. There's papers showing, in a sense, that if you add superfluidity to this calculation, you kill this entirely. Then there are calculations showing that in general relativity, because now this calculation of the neutral point is much easier than the calculation of modes, because you look at it effectively for a zero frequency solution. Um, and then the quadrupole mode becomes, comes into play for relativistic stars. So it, it could be different. Okay? So, so now we're going to jump forward. About 20 years. And we're going to ask, is this all there is? And to answer that, we're going to write down the actual Euler equation to linear order in rotation. So then we have some perturbed velocity, acceleration term. We have a Coriolis force, usual 3D uh, levity theta. And this is what gives you things like tornadoes, stuff like that. We have the thing we saw before, one of the row, uh, grad I delta P. We have the minus one of the row squared delta rho grad P. And we have gravitational force. Okay. And then we ask, what happens in the static limit of this problem? So then you see static limit would be there's no, nothing here, nothing here, just this piece here. Okay. There's going to be some static piece that just has these piece, these bits, right? And then we also get from continuity, we get this stuff, one over rho, grad i delta p, minus rho squared delta rho grad i p, plus grad i delta phi. Okay. And from continuity, we get, again, there's no time derivative of density, but there's gonna be a grad i rho delta v, okay? This comes straight out from, from this. And now it's a very, very subtle argument that took people a little bit of time to understand, which is that this is a static limit. So this is really just a perturbation that takes you from a star to another star, okay? So basically you add a bit of density and you shift the star along some sequence, okay? So this is the only thing that has true dimension, true, that is called dynamics. This leads to what's called inertial modes in the, geophysics literature. Now we're going into terrestrial physics again. Okay. And so the calculation we're gonna try and do, we're not gonna do much of it, but a little bit, 
is such that instead of solving like we did yesterday, we look at this equation and say, are there solutions such that velocity is order one, but these guys are not order one. This whole set is some order omega. So I'm expanding in the rotation, right? This guy's leading and these guys come off. Or rescale that maybe. The Xi is order one. So that gives me that delta V is order omega. So it has the right sort of dimensions if you like. And then delta P, delta rho, and delta phi is order omega squared. So this is the problem. This is not the problem we did yesterday, right? Yesterday we didn't have any rotation, so this doesn't make any sense. And if we solved only for these, right? And then we solved that they were all the same order. But now I'm saying there should be perhaps a different ordering in this problem that picks up something new, okay? And this problem is really, really messy. Okay, really messy. To solve this numerically is messy because you need to couple the different spherical harmonics here are gonna couple. You expand this before, it gets horrendous. But there's one situation that's easy. Now I've done exactly what I did the other day. I get to a crunch point here. I need to go over there and then come back, which I guess is good. It keeps me away. Is we exercise. There's one simple case. Remember yesterday, we said that Xi can be expanded in three pieces, right? There was something like this. It goes like schematically a W times radial basis vector plus a V times gradient of YLM and a U sub to sine, it doesn't matter times the cross product of these two guys. Okay. And yesterday we calculated here. Now we're gonna get rid of them. And we ask, are there solutions that are purely in this, what we call axial perturbation? And I probably said that in a pure fluid that doesn't rotate or anything, this can't exist. We just calculated the things that do exist, which is up here. Now I'm asking a different question. Question is, does the rotation allow these guys to exist? If so, what are the properties? So now what happens is you take that assumption. We had an expression for this yesterday, exactly what this was with our factors of R and stuff like that. Just plug it in here, okay? But with this ordering, you see that these guys are clearly going to be higher order than whatever is sitting here, right? In some sense. Although 
if the frequency is scales with the rotation rate, and this is order omega squared, it could be that they balance. We need to do a little bit of poking around here. Okay? So what comes out from this now? First of all, it's an equation that looks like this. L times L plus one. You've seen that before. That comes from the Laplacian, right? It's always there. Times the mode frequency in the rotating plane. Um, which is where we put in that fictitious Coriolis force. So this is in the rotating plane minus 2m omega, the rotation rate, times u with some multiple index L has to vanish. Okay. okay, what do we learn from this? Well, we learn that either this, this vanishes as it did yesterday, or if we insist that this doesn't vanish, the frequency we can have UL not zero if the omega is UM omega over L, L plus one. Okay. If I have that, then I cannot have another value of L, right? So there can only be one L, okay? Okay. So it seems this solution could exist. But that doesn't mean I'm, I've calculated it, right? It just says this is possible. Now, um, a little bit more work from the order equations again. We get two equations and we'll write them out because there's a very important argument here. L times omega R, just some numbers, minus two M omega. So you can look, this is not going to vanish because there's an L there should be L plus one. So this is not gonna go. Times R, yes, R D R U L. So some radial derivatives going to tell us if this works, okay? Plus U M L omega U L, all times some number that I'm gonna call Q L, with the index plus one, that has to vanish explain what that is in a minute. This comes from the recurrence relations or spherical harmonics where you relate derivatives to other spherical harmonics. That's where this comes from. So it's not difficult, it's just a little bit messy to get your head around. And then there's another equation which says, with more brackets, that L plus one omega r plus two M omega times this same thing, plus some stuff, U M L plus one, omega U L, big bracket, Q L has to vanish. Okay, so here are two equations for one variable, okay? What does that mean? It means it doesn't work, right? There is no solution, right? So it seems to be allowed over here, but now we seem to have a snag. So it all rests on this Q. And it is a messy thing, it's L minus M, L plus M over 
2L minus 1, 2L plus 1, all square rooted. So now you can almost set this as a as a challenge. Is there a way out? I have two equations, one unknown. That's not going to work. I've got so these bits are hopeless. I have to look over here. So can I get one of those to go? I can pick the L's and the M's. Right? The answer is yes. If I pick L being equal to M, then this is M and this is zero. So this vanishes. Okay. So only possibility and in that case it follows from the top equation and we now we can forget about this q because this doesn't vanish this is a simple od we just integrated that um goes like r to the m plus one It kind of looks like those R F modes that went to like R to the L. Behavior is really simple. Okay. So before we move on, let's just ask what happens in general for other L's and M's. Okay. So the answer is this. You can do this, but you need to build in these other guys as well. And the problem is then they couple to the different L's and it becomes a whole hierarchy of things. And it's really quite messy to calculate. So there are papers on that. If you're that way inclined, spend your time on them. It's a free country, but the calculation is messy, okay? So these are the general inertial modes, this guy, the bracket on that. This is called the R mode for rotation or it's got the relation with Rossby waves in the planets, in the Earth's atmosphere and stuff like that in geophysics. So the R can stand for whatever you want. It can just stand for pirates, right? R, that sort of thing. I don't know, it's, it's something. People have different opinions. <laughs> Okay, so now something magical is going to happen. Trust me. We're going to work out the pattern speed of this mode. Yeah? The pattern speed in the rotating frame. A rotating frame. is just sigma p is omega r minus sign over m. It's defined somewhere over there. So that's just taking this guy, dividing by m and adding on the minus sign to big omega over ll plus one. Okay. So that means this mode is always going backwards. Okay. 
So that was different to the F mode that we had one forwards, one backwards, and then they came together and swapped signs and stuff like this is always negative. This is for people that are sad and depressed and angry with life, right? It's always negative. So what happens in the inertial frame? Uh, now we need first to remember, remind ourselves how we within relate the two. So we need something like in the inertial frame, we have e to the i omega t, but now with an i on it, say inertial frame, plus the spherical harmonics, right? So an i m phi. But if you switch to the um, rotating frame, then you say that these phi coordinates are not the ones, fixed ones, they now rotate. And so you just bung that on here and say there's e to the i omega i t plus i m times some rotation plus some new phi angle, let's call it phi bar, doesn't matter, in the new rotating spherical coordinates, right? And then you just say this defines e to the i omega r times t plus m phi bar. So we are calculating in the rotating frame, we're using these spherical coordinates, but we only need to relate the frequencies. So we see that um, omega r is just omega i plus big omega, m omega like that. Okay? Now I have this, I want this. So I just plug this in and you find that Sigma P becomes a, um, omega over L times L plus one, like before, the same factor. But instead of two omega, I now get L minus one times L plus two. And that is always positive. Now, now we have a game changer because this instability said, if I have a mode that is forwards in, in the inertial frame, backwards in the rotating frame, it's unstable. Then we went through the F mode, so yeah, that might happen if we're a bit lucky. Now we have a mode that always does this, okay? Always. There's no critical rotation rate. If you try to spin the star even the slightest amount, it should be unstable, okay? So, all perfect fluid stars are unstable because of gravitational wave emission. So we're missing something, right? Because stars do rotate. So what are we missing? Well, this is quite easy, right? If you have um, an unstable system, when do you need to be worried? It's when the instability grows fast, right? For example, this is a formal mathematical thing. Maybe the instability growth time is order of the universe, lifetime of the universe, in which case I'm not going to worry about it. Sorry, it's not for me. Okay? 
or it's uh, millions, billions of years. I'm not going to worry about it because many other things happen in a star's life, right? It cools and things. Calculation is probably not valid. Okay? So now we work this out. Um, and so we work out growth time scale. That's always the first thing you do. You ask, okay, how fast does this grow? Okay. And now for convention later, I'm going to put the minus sign on this. It's just a kind of weird to think about negative times. But, and the number that comes out is about 50. This is not going to exist. Depends on the equation of state and things like that. Scale for a typical neutron star mass, 1.4 solar masses. Some power, minus one. Radius, 10 kilometers, say, to the minus four. And spin, period, say, one millisecond to a large power, six power. So very fast pulsars, this is a small number, say millisecond pulsars is order one. This is order one. So it grows on the time scale of a minute. Okay? Now a minute is short on astronomical sort of scales. Right? So this is fast. So it's still not looking good. But of course, we take the sun. The sun is weighs about the same, but it's much, much bigger. Okay? <laughs> And so, you know, at the end of the day, and it spins in a completely different way. So that, there, you're not in trouble. In fact, if you take a white dwarf, also this time scale becomes really low. But it's really only neutron stars. Okay? Well, for neutron stars, we seem to be in business. So now you need to ask, okay, what could possibly stop us? So the first thing you do is you go back over here and say, look, people did a lot of work on this in the 1980s, 90s, beginning of the 90s, okay? Can I just copy what they did and plug it into my calculation and repeat, okay? And so people learned that in the first instance, what we need is friction, which is shear viscosity and fluids. And so you get two results. So shear viscosity gives you some um, damping, depending on the, what particles there are and all sorts of things, which I don't think I want to talk about. And this is seven times 10 to the seven, which is a bit bigger than 50. Same mass scaling, have some different number, five fours, sun radius, kilometers, also some funny scaling, 23 quarters, and temperature, because this doesn't care about spin, 10 to the 9 Kelvin to quadratic order. Okay. It's a number, but this is a high temperature. So if I go to very low temperatures, I bring this down. Okay. So if the temperature is low enough, I can kill this. Then we have the thing we kind of talked about. The fact that the oscillation drives the fluid out of equilibrium and there will be nuclear reactions. That leads to something called bulk viscosity. You know how quick these reactions are. So there's a number for this. And it's also a big number. In fact, the numbers go up. We got three times 10 to the 11. It's almost you know, inverse gravitational wave strength, that sort of thing. And some mass scaling, I think it's straight. And 
mass and inverse in radius from there as follows. This depends on spin. Quadratic, and then when you squeeze in a temperature because otherwise you're in trouble. But this goes like inverse power to the second of my power. Okay? So here I've got the inverse power of temperature. If the temperature gets really high, then this becomes small, and this can win at high temperature. And so now you need to ask, okay, what happens here really? Is this clearly depends, M and R are fixed, the spin is fixed, kind of, but I can ask what happens at different spins and at different temperatures, right? And so, I just work out when do these different things balance, right? So as you can see, think of solving one over T, G, W. These things tend to add like parallel resistors. So we call something like this. This is basically a rate of energy loss. Right? And that's why I put this minus sign in here. So now it actually could be something equivalent, okay? And then that gives you something we call the instability window. And it looks schematically something like this. This is P or omega. This is T. Is some some spin above which I'm not allowed to go because the star will break up, start shedding matter, or uniform rotation. My calculation is uniform rotation. I better stop drawing there, right? And then we get that low temperatures at shear viscosity winds, right? It looks that they don't. This is not accurate in any shape or form, any long scale, anything, it's just a line, okay? So this is shear. At higher temperatures, the bulk viscosity comes in. And below these, these guys dominate, okay? But above these, have, actually that works, we use this recycling. Okay. So in the temperature spin plane calculations, these estimates suggest there's actually quite a large instability window, okay. which may be relevant for young neutron stars, which will be born, so if this born spinning fast enough, they're hot enough, they come in over here and they will be affected by the instability in some way until they exit, spinning slower, presumably, because you need to take the energy from them. Or if you've got old neutron stars that are cold and they accrete matter to spin up, they will enter something like this. And then the question is, are they allowed to go in here or do they stop here? Okay. So those two ideas tell you, you can look at what do young pulsars do? How fast do they spin? So funny enough, these calculations here, the 1998 calculations, are consistent with the birth spin of the crab pulsar. But we know there are pulsars that are born spinning faster than that. So this you know, can't be quite right. And this number here could be consistent with accreting 
the spin we see in accreting low mass X-ray binary systems, but this model predicts that they're not allowed to spin as fast as they can, as they do. So, moreover, we haven't said anything about when it stops. This is a fluid dynamics thing. At some point, it's going to stop growing. It's a saturation where it can't grow any bigger. And that gets really messy. So, this is pretty much where I wanted to get to. I wanted to give you an idea of the ingredients. But in the last 25 years, there's been a lot of work on the physics trying to figure out what the dissipation mechanisms could be that gets us closer to the actual observed systems. That's still not solved, I think. There are things putting more physics in, superfluids, magnetic fields, stuff like that, makes the problem much harder. Still not solved. The problem is not fully solved in general relativity. And the nonlinear problem kind of has been solved in a way, but there's still work to do. So it's been 25 years, but there's a lot of work to do here as well. Okay? But this is the basic story of the Chandrasekhar Friedman Schutz instability, why it works, and why the lesson could be that we do what we think we know, right? But we have to be aware that there could always be something we're overlooking. Okay? So I'll tell you a little anecdote. It will take minus one minute. I did some of this work in 97, 98. I told, I was talking to John Friedman and Bernard Schutz about this at that time. The first email I sent to John Friedman, he responded saying, that can't be true. Okay. Then he sent an email saying, actually, I sat down and did some calculations. You're right. We missed this. Okay. And then I had later on, I sat down, was visiting Bernard Schutz, and he said, I can't believe we missed this. And where the anecdote is going is this. There were two guys called John Papalosio and, and uh, Jim Pringle, Cambridge astronomers, astrophysicists, that worked on the R modes of stars, discovered them in a sense in astrophysics in 1978. Okay. In their paper, they, they did that on R modes. Then they had another paper on the accretion of preventing accretion spin-up of stars, where they mentioned the Chandrasekhar Friedman Schutz instability. If they had just taken a step back and added their two papers together, they would have done this 25 years earlier. So my message to you is, don't listen to anything I've said. Ask yourself what I didn't say, because probably, possibly, there are some other things out there to be discovered. Okay? That's the lesson here, I think. There's a lot of hard work that's been done, but for me, it's a question of, are we missing something? And so that's up to you. And now we definitely stop. Let's have lunch. And maybe if you have any questions, just come and find me, okay? I'll stay here for a bit. Yes. Yes. Well, the calculation says that you're only allowed that. Now, the general, as I said, the general inertial mode where you have all the variables has many different values of L and M. Okay, so then there's a whole infinite set of them, and they're much more complicated. But this is very special because it comes out like that. Yes. Um, actually, that is not true. It turns out that for the friction parameters we expect in a superfluid, 
uh, this is there's much less input impact on the R modes than it has on the F modes. That's just the way it comes out. So we don't think that superfluidity has a huge effect. But unless the superfluid parameters are different from the ones we usually assume, which could be true. So it's a bit open. But the details, you know, that's where the details make a difference. Also, from gravitational waves, it's very unusual. Because the gravitational waves you're taught in class typically is uh, mass multiples. That's all that matters. This, because of the curl, of the cross product we have, right, is a current. So this is current multiples, which traditionally we ignore. Right? We're always told, Post-Newtonian theory tells us current multiples are higher order, forget about them. This is, uh, I think, maybe the only gravitational wave mechanism that radiates mainly through currents, which also tells you, don't listen to people when they talk to you. For example, in earlier in the 1990s, when I was even younger than today, I was working with Bernard Schutz in Cardiff as a postdoc, and we were working on axial modes, these kinds of modes, but for non-rotating stars in general relativity. Turns out they exist because of wave trapping. Okay? And Kip Thorne came to visit. And when Kip Thorne came to visit, we all had to have an audience with Kip, where he, he just wanted to talk about what we were doing, so we all met with him, okay? And I remember he said to me, why are you working on axial modes? They're never going to be interesting. We didn't know this then. Right? I'm just saying again, we, we build on what we know. And then there's a risk that we get blinkered and ignore everything that we don't know. Right? So look at so with you know, in gravitational wave searches to say, Look under the light, because it's brighter there. That's where you're more likely to see something. But of course, the sources are not going to be there. That's it. There's going to be things for you to discover. Right? We just don't know that. I can't tell you what they are. If I could, I would do it myself. Sorry, I wouldn't tell you. But they will be there. We just don't know what they are. So think outside. Right? Read other stuff. That, that's my advice. Surely you want lunch now. No, no one wants lunch. They want more. <laughs> Don't want more. Okay, let's have lunch.